talk. Thank you, Phil. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben, and Happy New Year to everyone. I hope you got some sleep last night. I did not. There we go. Good. Well, as, um, as, as Ben has said, we've been in Luke's Gospel, haven't we, over the course of the Christmas period. And if you want to pick one up, there's still a load at the back of the room over there, so do grab one of those. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we were here thinking about Mary's song as she was praising God about the birth of her son, Jesus. And today we're going to hear another song, the song of a man called Zechariah, after the birth of his son, John. But before we do that, we're going to hear it read in a moment. Before we do that, I want to remind us of the events around the birth of John. So I'm going to invite Zechariah. Zechariah, up you come. Um, here's Zechariah. Doesn't he look wonderful? Now, Zechariah was an old man. Okay, Zechariah is an old man and he was married to a woman called Elizabeth who was an old woman and very, very sadly, they hadn't been able to have children. They'd cried out to God, they'd prayed to God, but still no children. And Zechariah was a priest, okay, so he got to wear things like this. I never know which way around this goes and I'm not sure that, hmm, maybe open the neck a bit wider. I'm going to let you work that out. There we go. How does that go on? Something like that. There we go. It's got bells and everything, brilliant. Zechariah was a priest, okay? And his job was to work, to work in the temple. If you could just shuffle over, I'm gonna put my temple up here, okay? Let's hope it sticks, didn't last time. Okay, the temple, remember, was that building that God had given to his people to say, look, I live with you, I live with my people. And one day, it was Zechariah's job. Zechariah's job was to take some fire, here's some fire, okay? and to go into the temple. His job was to go into the temple, to go and offer, burn some incense inside the temple. And the people outside, well, they waited. Zechariah had gone into the temple, they were waiting. They were waiting and it seemed to be taking much longer than usual. What was going on? What was going on? Was he dead? I don't know. Well, they could hear the bells jangling. So he must still be alive, right? You could hear the bells jangling. So, they're not very loud bells, are they? But there we go. So he must still be alive, but what was going on? Why was it taking so long? They didn't know. Until eventually, Zechariah comes out of the temple. Zechariah, what's going on, say the people? Why did it take so long? What was happening? What's going on? He's seen something. He's seen something. He can't speak for some reason. What has he seen? What has he seen? Oh, any ideas? What might he be trying to show us that he's seen? What's he seen, Joseph? An angel, he thought he'd seen an angel. Okay, now we don't really know what angels look like, but this might be maybe what, he's seen, seen an angel. Okay, inside the temple, angels are messengers sent from God. Okay, he's seen an angel, how did that make you feel? How did it make him feel? Scared. Okay, but angels are messengers, aren't they? Messengers from God. So if they're a messenger, they must have brought a message. What was the message that the angel brought? The angel. What's the message? A baby. Zechariah and Elizabeth were going to have a baby. Isn't that amazing news that the angel had brought? Thank you, Zechariah. Sit down for a moment. Here's, we're just going to read it. Here's what the angel had said. The angel had said, your wife Elizabeth will give birth to a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will bring many of the people of Israel back to the Lord their God and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But do you know what? Zechariah had refused to believe it. Surely not, that couldn't happen, not at their old age, no way. So the angel had said this, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. He hadn't believed God's words, so he would lose his words. And we cut to nine months later and Zechariah, Zechariah is coming up and God's word has come true. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they've had a baby. Isn't it amazing? Against all the odds, it's a miracle baby. But Zechariah still can't speak. And as people do when, when someone's had a baby, everyone wants to know, what are you going to call the baby? And the people say, I know what we should call the baby. Let's call the baby Zechariah. Show. Isn't that a good name? Just like his father. That's a good idea. It's a good name. It means God will remember. What a good name. And eventually they get round to asking Zechariah, what are you actually going to call your baby? But of course he can't speak, so they have to give him a writing tablet. Here we go. Let me hold the baby for a bit. And here's your writing tablet. What are you going to call the baby? What is, what is Zechariah going to call the baby? And he wrote on his writing tablet with all the people watching, watching, watching. And then he showed them. This is what he said. His name is John. Well, they weren't expecting that. They definitely weren't expecting that. Thank you, Zechariah. Go and have a seat. You can take that with you. Thank you very much. They weren't expecting that at all. Um, 
but it's a great name, isn't it? It means God is gracious. And hadn't God been gracious to Zechariah despite his unbelief? But do you know what? Much more importantly, that was what God had told Zechariah to call his son, wasn't it? Zechariah had lost his voice because he hadn't believed God's words. Now by calling his son John, he was able, he was taking God at his word, wasn't he? And so incredibly, his mouth was open and he said, Praise the Lord, he said. Look what had happened. His, over here, his, his unbelief had turned, oh, all the way around, not falling over anything, had turned into praise. His unbelief at what God had said had turned into praise for what God had done. So what would he praise God for, I wonder? Was it for getting his voice back? Was it for the fact that he had a miracle baby? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to read it. Pascaline's going to come up and read it. If you've got a Bible, it's page 1027. Let's read what Zechariah praised God for. So the reading today is from Luke 1, verse 67 to 80 on page 1027. Page 1027. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hates us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath is swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew, and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Brilliant. Thank you, Pascaline. Did you notice what Zechariah praised God for? It wasn't for the fact that he got his voice back. It wasn't even really for the fact that he'd had a miracle baby. His baby only got a few words. No, Zechariah's song of praise was all about something else, someone else, the one that John would prepare the way for. Look at verse 68. Zechariah sings, Praise be to the Lord God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed them. The Lord has come, he says, not John has come. His praise, his praise is all about Jesus, Jesus the Saviour. I guess he'd had nine months, hadn't he, sitting there in silence, pondering, thinking and realising just how amazing this baby that his son was going to announce really, really was. And so he cannot help but burst out in praise. He's gone from unbelief to praise. And my hope is that this morning we'll join him somewhere along that journey from unbelief to praise. Perhaps unbelief in the sense of total unbelief and scepticism. Perhaps unbelief in the sense that once again Christmas has passed you by. It's passed you by and somehow everything else just seemed more important. Or perhaps unbelief in the sense that actually we know Christmas is important. We know it's good news, but we just long. We long for it to change us from the inside out as we move continually from unbelief to praise. But before we do that, we're going to sing. So if I can invite um, Shlom and Sophie back up, that would be great. The words of this song are basically pinched from Zechariah. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing it together. Do you stand up? Well, let's think about what Zechariah has seen, shall we, in the song that we've just heard sung, in the song that we've just heard read. As Zechariah wrote. Abby's going to come in and help me and uh, we're going to have a think about what Zechariah says in this song. Where's Abby gone? Hi Abby. Um, hi Abby, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Come up to the microphone for me. Um, Abby, there's, um, there's something different about you today. 
for some reason you, you just look like a strong and mighty warrior. <laughs> I can't work out what it is. Um, is, it, is it your socks maybe? Have you got strong and powerful socks on? Well, yeah, but that's not quite it. <laughs> Jumper? Is it your jumper? Maybe it's your jumper. Have you got a strong and powerful jumper on? Is that what it is? Is that what it is? <laughs> it's not what it is. What is it? What is it that makes me think she's a strong and mighty warrior today? Any ideas? Any ideas, Phoebe? What is it, her? Yeah. Her hat! Her hat! It's her Viking helmet, isn't it? With those big, scary horns on the top of it. See, horns make us think, wow, don't mess with Abby, right? She's a big, scary scary Viking warrior, right? Thank you, Abby. Go and have a seat. Why don't you give her a round of applause for her Viking impression? Okay. Now, in the Bible, horns are a symbol of strength, okay? So Zechariah said this, didn't he? Let me read to you what Zechariah said. Zechariah said, God has raised up a horn of salvation for us, okay? Jesus is described as a horn. There's a horn, just one horn. There we go. And it's the first of two images we're going to see about Jesus today. Okay? Now, why do we need Jesus to be a horn of salvation? Well, it's because we need him to be strong and we need him to be powerful, don't we? I wonder, do some of us ever have the wrong idea about why Jesus came? Here's an idea just here. Some people think that Jesus came perhaps just to be, oh, where's it gone? Just to be a good example for us, to, to show us how to live so we can follow him. But if that's the case, then, then why do I need him to be a horn? Why do I need him to be strong and powerful? I'm not strong and powerful, am I? So how could I ever follow him? Well, some people think this. Some people think Jesus came to be a good teacher, to say clever and inspiring things. But if that's the case, why do I need him to be a horn, to be strong and powerful? Well, some people think Jesus came just to show us that, that he knows us, that he understands what it's like to be one of us, and that should be a comfort for us. And you know what? That's absolutely true. But it can't be the whole picture. Otherwise, why would Jesus need to be a horn, a strong and powerful horn of salvation? Why do we need Jesus to be a horn of salvation? Well, did you see what Zechariah said? Verse 71, Zechariah said, it's for salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Verse 74, it's to rescue us from the hand of our enemies. God's people need Jesus to be strong, to be a horn, because they, because we, if we're Christians, we have enemies. I wonder if that's why we sometimes struggle to believe that Christmas is such, a good, is such good news. Have we forgotten we have enemies? Or maybe that's why we struggle to praise God, because we've forgotten the enemies that Jesus came to rescue us from. We've got enemies. Now, I've put three enemies up around the room. I wonder if three children would bring me up the three enemies, if you can see them, that would be really helpful. There you go, we're going to get one over there. Fab, there's one over there, and there's one more. I need one more person who's gonna bring me an enemy. Any more volunteers? Thank you, Joe, go and get that one for me. Super duper. Thank you, don't show everyone what it is yet. Don't show everyone what it is yet, that's really important. Okay, you've got number two of you, Lydia. Lydia, can you come and stand right here and show everyone the number two, well done. Super duper, thank you very much. Oh, no, that was right. Oh, no, that was wrong. Sorry, thank you. Here we go, come stand here for me. Thank you very much. Joe, come stand there. Brilliant, thank you. These are our enemies, okay? Not these people, these are lovely people. We like these people very much, okay? They're just holding pictures, okay? Now, we've got three enemies, okay? Now, Joe, can you turn your one deck round? Here's enemy one, okay? Enemy one is Satan or the devil, and the Bible calls him the accuser, pointing the finger at us, telling us we're guilty. I wonder, have we forgotten about him? How he keeps a track record of everything we've ever done that displeases God. How he tries to get us to stop trusting God and start living our own way instead. He's an enemy, okay? Lydia, show us our second enemy. The second enemy is the world. It's the people around us who don't want anything to do with Jesus. I wonder, do we forget that that's what all, all people are like on their own anyway? Have we forgotten how people treated Jesus in his lifetime? And how Jesus said that's how God's people would be treated as well. And we see that, don't we? Christians here are rejected and laughed at and marginalized. And Christians in other places beaten, persecuted, even killed for following Jesus. Our second enemy and our third enemy, can we turn that one round for me, is what we call the flesh inside us. Have we forgotten there's a battle going on inside us? Yes, Christians, we want to follow Jesus, don't we? But every day our sinful nature wants us to follow our own desires, to do our own thing. We've got enemies. Thank you, give those to me, give them a round of applause. Super duper, thank you very much. 
You see why we need Jesus to be a horn of salvation, to be strong, because we've got enemies. God's people have enemies who don't want us to serve God. So when Jesus rescues us from him, this is what's true. Let me read you this. It's to enable us to serve him, that serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. That's why we need our enemies to be defeated. And do you know what? This is what God had planned all along. And Zechariah reminds us some really key things from the Old Testament, showing us that God had planned that he would send Jesus as a horn of salvation. The first thing is that word he used. Remember, he said, God has redeemed us. He's reminding us. He's reminding us of another great, famous redemption of God's people in the Old Testament through a man called Moses. Moses is going to come up. Okay, do you remember Moses? Okay, Moses, Moses was used by God to rescue God's people from slavery in Egypt. Do you remember this? They were slaves. And do you remember God delivered them? He rescued them from their enemies by destroying by destroying the, um, the Egyptian army. Oh, there's an arrow. Can you come stand here, James? Just because otherwise the arrow doesn't make sense. There we go. Brilliant. And Zechariah is reminding us, is saying to us, look, now God in Jesus, God through Jesus has brought about a new redemption of God's people. He's going to really rescue us from our enemies again. Okay. Our second person that Zechariah reminds us of is David. Where's David gone? Here comes David. You remember King David? What do kings have? Kings need a crown, don't they? There we go, brilliant. You remember King David, how King David rescued God's people from their enemies, from Goliath? Do you remember Goliath, the giant? Do you remember the Philistine armies? King David rescued them from their enemies, didn't he? And looking forward to Jesus, God said through the prophets that one day another king would come, a greater king would come, one in David's family, one who would finally bring peace by defeating God's enemies completely. And a third person that we're reminded of is our ancestors, or Zechariah's ancestors, up you come ancestors, they don't have any names, I'm afraid. Zechariah says he's shown mercy to our ancestors. Now, God's people got it wrong a lot through the Old Testament. They sinned and they turned away from God. So God sent enemies against them to, to get them to turn back to him. People like the Assyrians, like the Moabites, loads of people, and they did turn back to him. And they had to offer sacrifices. Here's a sacrifice. There we go, can you hold that for me? They had to offer sacrifices and um, cry out to God for his mercy that he'd rescue them from their enemies. And do you know what? He did rescue them from their enemies. Um, although those sacrifices didn't actually bring mercy, they were pointing towards a future day when God would send Jesus to really bring mercy, to really rescue them from their enemies. And finally, our last person is Abraham. Okay, up comes Abraham. Do you remember God's covenant with Abraham and his family? Come and stand over here. Thank you very much. Do you remember God's covenant with Abraham and his family? Do you remember all those, all those promises? Oh, there we go, can we hold that? Do you remember all those promises that God gave Abraham of land and children and blessing that God would curse Abraham's enemies? And looking forward to Jesus, do you remember how God said that one of Abraham's descendants would be the one through whom God's blessing would come to the whole world so that God's people from every nation could be rescued from their enemies? Look at all this that Zechariah is reminding us of. This was what God's plan was all along, to send Jesus a horn of salvation to rescue us from our enemies. Thank you very much. Go sit down. You can take your props. Thank you. Go on then. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Zechariah has gone, hasn't he? He's gone from unbelief. He has gone to praise. He spent time and he's realised how Jesus is the one who will rescue God's people from their enemies. Now I wonder, have we forgotten our need of his rescue? Have we forgotten those enemies we need rescuing from? We have real and powerful enemies. Do you see, if we've got enemies, we have to have Jesus as our horn of salvation, don't we? We're going to sing again, and if I can invite musicians up. We're going to sing a song that starts, Joy has dawned um, with the birth of Jesus, promised from creation, God's promised horn of salvation, as we've just learned about. Do stand. Brilliant, thanks. Do have a seat again. Well, Zechariah's told us, hasn't he, how Jesus is the horn of salvation we need to rescue us from our enemies. But there's a second image that Zechariah uses to tell us about Jesus, which has helped him and will help us as we move from unbelief through to praise. Let's read verse 76, shall we? This is Zechariah, says says to John, and you, my child, talking to John, you will be called a prophet of the Most High, 
for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Do you see that? It's not very long until, well, Zechariah's talking about Jesus again, isn't he? His son got about three words in all of that, okay? It's a bit like this, it's a bit like this. Let me show you something. Where have I put it? Here's the moon, okay? I never know which way up to hold the moon, okay? Now, have you ever looked up at the moon and gone, wow, the moon is amazing, isn't it? Okay, you look up there and you go, oh, it's so bright. It's incredible. How is it so bright? Do you know what? It must be really, really hot, mustn't it? To give out all that light, it must be. That must be what's going on. But of course, that's, that's not what's going on, is it? That's not what's happening at all. The only reason the moon gives us any light is it because it reflects the light from a much brighter light, the sun. It reflects the light from the sun. And Zechariah's baby John is going to be a little bit like that. Um, he will be great. John will be great, but only because he will, his task is to prepare God's people for a much greater light, that light of Jesus. And if we're going to move from unbelief through to praise, we need to see why Zechariah says Jesus is like the sun. Rachel's going to come and help us here, okay? And um, I want you to imagine that Rachel's gone on a country walk, okay? She loves walking. I don't actually know. Do you like walking, Rachel? She does like walking. Phew. <laughs> Didn't actually ask her that as I asked her. Okay, she's got her, she's got her hat. She's gone to go somewhere really cold. Okay, she's gone somewhere really cold for her walk. She's up in the mountains, actually. She's got a hat, she's got a coat, she's got her gloves. She's going for a walk, going for a walk. But for some strange reason, she's decided to go for a walk in the middle of the night. Hmm. Not a very good idea up in the mountains all by herself, is it? But there we go, she's going for it, and she can't really see where she's going. So she's walking around, she's walking around, walking around, and it's absolutely dark. And she's bumping into things, and she's falling over. And she, do you know what? She doesn't really know where she's going. She hasn't got a clue what's going on. What's going on? And then she says, I know what I'll do. I'll get my phone out. I'll get my phone out. Oh, oh uh, there we go. Which was somewhere in a snow drift somewhere. Finds her phone. Finds her phone very quickly. Gets her phone. And it's like, I'll be, I'll be okay. I've got my phone. But oh, battery's dead. No light. No maps. Wandering around in the dark. Lost. Bumping into things. Then she has another great idea. I know what to do. I'll sit down and I'll wait. Because morning's going to come, isn't it? Morning's going to come and then I'll be able to see the path. But oh, what I didn't tell you is that actually Rachel lives in this place here. Okay, this is Svalbard in Norway. Okay, now, now in Norway, sometimes it's dark for months on end. Imagine that. Isn't that weird? Okay, just months and months and months of darkness. So Rachel's sitting there in the dark and it's not going well. It's not great, is it? She's lost. She's completely lost. She lives in darkness. And the Bible actually says, actually, we're a bit like that. We're a bit like that in, in that without Jesus, actually, we can't know God. We have no way of knowing God. And the reason we can't know God, well, the reason we can't know God is, is our sin. Here you go, Rachel. Stand up for me, will you? Thank you. Okay, is that going to fit over your massive hood? That's the world's <laughs> biggest hood. There we go. The reason we can't know God is because of our sin, all the ways that we've turned away from God and rejected him. And actually, it's, it's worse than that because our sin not only means we can't know God, but we can't even have peace with God. We've actually made ourselves God's enemies. Okay, but that's not all. As, as you're there kind of fumbling around in the darkness, lost and, and, and tripping over things, bumping into things, suddenly a shadow looms over you. A big, scary shadow. You don't know what it is. You don't know who it is. You don't know if they want to hurt you. It's very, very scary. No matter what you do, where you go, you run around and it's still there. It's still there. It's still there. You can't shake it. This shadow. And so the Bible says not only do we live in darkness, not knowing God, unable to have peace with God, there lies over us a shadow. And that shadow is death. It's unavoidable, looming over us no matter where we turn, what happens when we die, when we face God that we can't know peace with. And so suddenly, suddenly as we live in darkness, in the shadow of death, suddenly, out of, out of seemingly nowhere, suddenly the rising sun bursts into the sea, bursts into the scene at last. And Zechariah says, Jesus, Jesus is that rising sun, come at last to rescue his people from their enemies. And with the rising of the sun, suddenly a path is made clear. Off you go, Rachel, go down a path somewhere. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. The path is made clear and suddenly that shadow, that shadow of death with the rising of the sun, it holds no fear for us 
anymore. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is the rising sun who's come to rescue his people from their enemies. Here's how Zechariah puts it. He says, it's because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the path of peace. Well, how precious is that? Do you remember that phrase? This is what Zechariah says. He says, the tender mercy of our God. Mercy because it's not what we deserved at all. Tender because it comes from his deep compassion for his people. Jesus, the rising sun, has come to rescue his people from their enemies. And John, Zechariah's son, John is going to get people ready for him. So I wonder, what's he going to tell them? Well, let's read on, shall we? It says, we read this earlier, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Here's how Jesus is going to rescue his people from his enemies. Here's what happens when Jesus, the rising sun, bursts in on us as we live in darkness. Sins can be forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? That second baby, of course, would grow up and live a perfect life and die for us a sacrificial death on the cross that anyone who trusts in him might have their sins forgiven. Now, in our society, I think we hear two things about sin, don't we? On the one hand, there's people who say, don't worry about your sin, the ways you've lived your own way instead of God's way. Don't worry about it. Move on. Go and live your life. Enjoy yourself. Get on with it. And then there's the line that says there are some people, some things that can never be forgiven. Never. We saw that recently with this man, didn't we? I don't know if you saw this. Matt Hancock, the former health secretary. He was on I'm a Celebrity in the Jungle. And he did, had to do horrible, horrible things like having guns pulled all over him and eating bugs and much worse things than that. It was absolutely horrible. Okay, now I don't want to talk about his time in office or whether he should have been on the show or anything like that. But what was interesting was to hear that he said he was there to try and find some forgiveness. And how did people respond? Well, well, some people were positive. Some people were positive, but there are others who said, no, it doesn't change anything. He can never be forgiven for what he did. But you know what? The Bible won't let us get away with either of those attitudes to sin. It tells us all sin, every way we turned away from God, it all matters. All of it matters. Now, the reason we're in darkness, the reason we can't know God, the reason we can't have peace with him, we mustn't make light of sin. But the Bible also says, on the other hand, wonderfully, all sin, any sin, by any person who puts their trust in Jesus and his death on the cross, all sin can be totally and utterly forgiven. Well, isn't that wonderful, wonderful news for us? Because don't we all carry around with us the knowledge of all the ways that we've rejected God's ways and tried to live our own ways instead? Isn't that wonderful? This is how Jesus, our horn of salvation, will defeat our enemies through the forgiveness of our sins. Let's think briefly about how that works, shall we? Um, can I have three volunteers who are going to come and hold my enemies up again? Oh, go on then, Joe, come back up. Anyone else? Come on, Lydia. Oh, we've got the same people. Come on, Jemima. There we go. Number three, can you hold it? Number three for me. That way round. Um, you can be number one this time. That way round. Thank you very much. And that way round. Remember these enemies that we've got that Jesus has come to rescue us from? Well, let's go through them, shall we? Okay, firstly, Satan. Remember how he accuses us and reminds us that we don't deserve to know God. But do you know what? Do you know what? If our sins are forgiven, then, then, then all his arguments are defeated, aren't they? We have peace with God. The devil yeah, is still active, but he is a defeated enemy. Lydia, what I'd like you to do now is just scrumple it up. Scrumple it up for me. Thank you so much. Defeated enemy. Okay? Do you remember our next enemy, the world? Okay? Jesus tells us people will go on rejecting God and treating God's people badly. But do you know what? If our sins are forgiven, then Christians can stand firm no matter what, can't we? We have peace with God. And one day Jesus guarantees everything will be made right. And we will live in peace with him forever. That second enemy, scrumple it up, please. Thank you, Jemima. And thirdly, our third enemy, the flesh. Remember that battle inside us. To live God's way, it will go on for the whole of our lives. But if our sins are forgiven, what happens is Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to live in us so we can put sin to death in our lives. And one day Jesus guarantees we will live totally free from it. Isn't that wonderful? Joe, scrumple that one up, up for me. Brilliant. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. Go sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can take that. You can give it to me. Fine. Didn't want them. Funny that. Isn't that good news? Jesus, our horn of salvation, who came to defeat our enemies, and he does it 
through the forgiveness of our sins. Well, what's going to help us to move from unbelief to praise? What's going to help us? Well, remember Jesus, the horn of salvation. Remember how terrible those enemies are that he's rescued us from. And remember Jesus, the rising sun, bursting in on our darkness to defeat our enemies by bringing the forgiveness of sin. Should we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we, we want to praise you and we want to move away from unbelief. So please help us to worship you and praise you for Jesus, our horn of salvation, who has defeated our enemies. And for Jesus, the rising sun, bursting in on our darkness, that we might have forgiveness. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Phil. Wonderful. We're going to sing off.